on Facebook. We're recording. Thank you for being here. We will start in just a moment as the room fills up. You'll notice that the transcript is enabled, the closed captioning. Okay, we'll start in just a moment. Okay. Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Sarah Ann Minkin, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Foundation for Middle East Peace, FMEP. Welcome to today's conversation, Nakba, Mob Violence and Inequality, the Past, Present, and Future of Palestinian Citizens of Israel. Some housekeeping as we begin. First, the format. The format for today's webinar, for today's event, will be a discussion between the panelists and me, ending at 12.15 Eastern. We are recording and live streaming on Facebook. Hello, hello to everyone on Facebook. We have prepared our questions, but in addition to my own questions, I'm eager to take audience questions. So please submit them via the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can do that at any time throughout the panel. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A box and will do my very best to weave in as many of your questions as possible into the discussion. Please keep an eye on the chat box, which is where my colleagues at FMEP will be putting useful links and information during the discussion. Please don't put questions into the chat box because I will not see them. And finally, please note that we have enabled the closed captioning function so that you can also read this discussion. And now to begin. This past May, Palestinian citizens of Israel took to the streets to demonstrate solidarity with Palestinians under attack in Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. As many Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line and in the diaspora spoke of a new Palestinian unity, Palestinian demonstrators inside of Israel were met with violence from organized gangs of Israeli Jews, leading to clashes that caused many casualties, including deaths. Israeli police not only failed to protect Palestinian citizens of Israel, but in the aftermath of the protests and clashes, the police targeted thousands of Palestinian citizens with arrest. Jewish Israeli politicians incited against them, and the mainstream media was flooded with articles warning of the end of coexistence, so-called coexistence. What really happened in May, and what has changed since? How does the narrative of Palestinian integration into Israel relate to those events and their aftermath? How do Palestinian citizens of Israel see their struggles relating to the struggles of Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, Jerusalem, and elsewhere? And how does the history and present reality of the Nakba shape Palestinian citizenship in Israel? To shed light on these questions and other issues, I am so grateful to be joined today by these three experts. You can read their full bios on our website, fmep.org. I will give them quick introductions now. First, Hana Amori, a resident of Jaffa. She's been active for two decades in many civil society struggles, including the housing and land struggles in Jaffa, and most recently, the struggle against crime and weapons proliferation in Palestinian society. She directed Sadaka Reut, a small organization promoting binational partnership in the seeking of a shared, equal, and just society, and most recently worked in the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung Foundation, steering the foundation's strategy towards Palestinian society in Israel. We also have with us Orwa Suitat, who earned his PhD in urban and regional planning from the Technion, the Institute of Technology, his research is centered on the relations between states and minorities in planning, and he works as a consultant for cultural and social integration in planning. Orwa lives in Haifa. And last, we have Rami Yunus, a Palestinian filmmaker, writer, and journalist from Lid. Most recently, he was a fellow at the Harvard Divinity School. Rami served as a parliamentary consultant and media spokesperson for Palestinian member of Knesset, 
Hanin Zouabi, and he is currently finishing his first feature film, Lid in Exile, a documentary about his hometown. Thank you, Rami, Orwa, and Hana for being here. So to begin, Rami, I'm going to ask you to start us off. Will you set the scene for us broadly? We know that in May during Ramadan, there was escalation in Jerusalem, Jerusalem around the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif and Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, and also in Gaza. What happened inside of 48 Israel? We're going to get into the details of Lid and other cities as we continue, but start us off, please. What happened? So in order, Sarah Ann, to understand what really happened in the land of 48, meaning the land that was occupied in 1948, we need to uh, 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 dig deeper into what happened in the land that was occupied in 1967, meaning Jerusalem and, uh, and uh, Gaza. So um, many people forgot, but this unrest, this uh, May unrest, the events of May 2021, actually started in April 2021 uh, with the Israeli police's decision to put barriers in Damascus Gate, uh, which functions as the town's main square, I mean, the, the, the Palestinian side of, of, of Jerusalem, of course, uh, and thus preventing the Palestinians from having their Ramadan nights. You know, it's one of the uh, very well-known traditions of, 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 of being in, 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 the, in the old city in Jerusalem and, and being in Damascus Gate. The official excuse by the Israeli police was, of the Israeli police was they wanted to prevent harassments, which was then kind of funny because when we call them for murder, they don't even show up. So, uh, so what kind of harassments were they trying to, to prevent there? Uh, another theory was that Netanyahu was putting pressure on the Israeli police back then uh, in order to create this tension that will lead to an escalation in order to avoid his trial. So there were many theories back then, but none of them changed change the, 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 uh, the harsh reality of what happened, what followed next. Uh, the decision led to a lot of violence between Palestinian youth and Israeli police. Uh, um, this violence was kind of streamed on TikTok and was shared with uh, teenagers and other Palestinians in all of Palestine, from the river to the sea. Uh, mind you, in the background, we still had what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, our viewers uh, uh, remember, or if they haven't seen, they should totally uh, go on uh, Muna's, uh, Muna, Muna Al-Kurds Al -Kurds, uh, Instagram page and watch the, uh, uh, the very famous why, Yaakov, Why Do You Steal My Home video that reached millions of views. Uh, and shed a lot of light of what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, a Palestinian woman was talking to an Israeli settler uh, who, by the way, um, is an American citizen with, uh, with uh, his home address uh, registered in Long Island. <laughs> um, so uh, she confronted him for, uh, for basically trying to steal her home. Um, so uh, there was also that happening in Sheikh Jarrah. The movement in Sheikh Jarrah was gaining momentum. At the, same, at the same time, with tension escalating in, in, in East Jerusalem, um, Israeli police uh, decided to cancel the flag parade. The flag parade is an annual event. Uh, um, the participants of the flag parade are mainly Israeli settlers that go about the old city of Jerusalem with Israeli flags and chant racist chants towards its Arab citizens. Uh, uh, and by that, they actually commemorate, this is how they commemorate the occupation of Jerusalem in 1967. So back then there was some tension starting to build up between the Israeli police and the Israeli government. The Israeli government was pushing for that event to happen while the Israeli police tried to call it off. Eventually the event happened uh, uh, an escalation of course followed with Hamas try, uh, uh, filing uh, uh, um, uh, a missile at uh, 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 Jerusalem. And then escalation happened in Gaza. Now this is where it got truly historic for Palestinian citizens of Israel. Up until now, we were talking about events that were transpiring in 1967, the land of 1967, meaning Gaza Strip and occupied East Jerusalem. The events that followed surprised everyone in Israel, I think including most Palestinians. People took to the street on every Palestinian town, every binational city, almost everywhere, and demonstrated in support of both Gaza and Jerusalem. Uh, this was met with a lot of police brutality. And, uh, and that led to clashes between Jews and Arabs uh, uh, in, in, in binational cities. So in order to understand, in order to, to really fathom what happened in 1948, people need to remember that the people of 1948 are Palestinians after all, and they feel a deep connection 
to the people that reside in the land of 1967. Um, so, so yeah, and, and, and this was very broad and very broad lines. Obviously there are a lot of nuances that we're not gonna go, go into right now. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, kind of what happened in, um, in May. Thank you. That was a great start. That was really helpful. You used a term that we don't use very often in English, binational cities. Can you just ex unpack that for us for a moment? Well, we have a city planner that is like in the square uh, uh, under me. So I'm sure he's going to talk about that uh, in a in, in few minutes. Uh, uh, binational cities, when we talk about binational cities, we mean, uh, uh, we refer to what we call in Arabic Palestinian cities. Cities that were Palestinian uh, before 1948 and were occupied. Uh, places like Lid, Haifa, Jaffa, uh, Akka, Ramleh. Um, we prefer the term binational cities as opposed to mixed cities because of the, I don't know, the uh, apartheid-esque aroma to it. Uh, a city by definition is a mixed place. New York is a mixed city. It's a mix of nationalities, of ethnicities. London is a mixed, is a, is a mixed city. But when Israelis talk about a mixed city, they mean it's us, the Israelis, mixing with them, the Arabs. So it's with the other, it's with the Arab. Uh, and this is, this is a term that is highly problematic uh, uh, for us because it's not us and them. A city by definition is a mixed place. So the, uh, the, the, the correct term should be binational cities, which means you have both nationalities, Palestinians and Israelis residing in one place. And when we talk about just one final, uh, uh, final detail, when we talk about binational cities, we refer to cities within Israel, within the Green Line, the land of 1948. Great, thank you. Thank you for being so clear. Arwa, was that okay? Was that, was that okay? Was that? Perfect. Oh, Great. You. I'm always thank nervous you. when he's here because he's, you know. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is why we bring him. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, great. So thank you, Rami, for setting us up. And thank you, you also, you set us up with what was historic about this moment. And Hana, I want to turn to you with that question also. You published an article in May about Jaffa in which you wrote, and now I'm, I'm quoting you, what we are witnessing now is a revolutionary spark calling for profound change rather than clashes or riots as depicted by the Israeli media. Therefore, the response of the state and its extensions, the police, right-wing settlers, and the vast majority of the Israeli media must be understood as an institutional counter-reaction aimed at suppressing Jaffa's indigenous population. Those are, those are your words. Will you explain this to us? Will you say more, please? Yeah. Yeah, I can say more. Uh, I think the story of May, to understand it, it really matters. Where do you start? Where is your starting point? Uh, and also, of course, what is the perspective of the storyteller? So I'd, like we will talk a lot about the Palestinians in Israel, but let's just for a moment look at the average Jewish person of Israel, yeah? like an, an average Israeli person. Who is this person? This is someone living a, a, in a Jewish city, usually, having a, someone who was educated in the Jewish education system, where for our listeners or viewers that don't know, the education system is separated in Israel. So this person does not have, have maybe little to almost any uh, almost nothing, almost no significant interactions uh, with Palestinians. These, the average Israeli Jewish person doesn't speak Arabic. They are fed and all their knowledge about what is happening in the world is based on the Israeli mainstream media. Uh, the Israeli mainstream media is very anti, uh, I don't want to say anti-Palestinians, but it is anti any kind of Palestinian resistance, if you want to say, or any kind of, of uh, 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 national uh, expression or tendency among Palestinians. So for <clears throat> the Israeli uh, Jewish person, the May events were really riots. And if you consider that most of, of Israelis are right-wing and the uh, uh, last many, many elections prove that the majority of uh, uh, Israeli Jews are right-wing, so, uh, um, and if we ask ourselves, what is actually right-wing in Israel and to put it in maybe American, ter like terms that Americans also use. So uh, uh, right-wing in Israel is basically now Jewish supremacy without apologies. 
this is what uh, uh, an average uh, right winger in Israel wants or thinks or, or uh, uh, aspires for. So it's not only that these were riots in their mind. This was also the ungrateful Arab minority, the ungrateful Arab citizens who've been given so much by the state, the only democratic state, uh, and all the, the, I'm not gonna repeat what the Israeli establishment says about itself, but in the eyes of those people, and I think in my analysis, this is what also was very uh, uh, um, encouraging for youngsters to go out to the streets and, and to look for Arabs. For example, in Jaffa, where I uh, live, we had mob, like mobs of people, very young people going to the streets looking for Arabs because how do you raise your head? You know, if you, if you believe that, if you, if you uh, uh, believe in Jewish supremacy, so Arabs standing in the streets with, with Palestinians flags, this is very, very annoying. This is very um, unthankful, ungrateful uh, from the minority. So, but if I switch to the average Palestinian person in Israel, and I will not talk only about Jaffa because Jaffa and like Rami said, the, the mixed cities or binational cities are the very minority of Palestinians living in them. But the majority of Palestinians in Israel live in uh, something very similar to a ghetto uh, without any horizon of improving from being a, 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 and looking like a, a ghetto. Um, Palestinians in Israel suffer from police hostility and uh, in every interaction with the police uh, and also suffer from under policing in the places where the police is actually needed in order to protect them. Uh, any political organizing or expression is faced with police brutality. Uh, so I'm describing the relationship in order to say that uh, uh, the average Palestinian person doesn't have any trust in the state or in the police or in its symbols. Yeah? Uh, we can add to this the discrimination that still exists. We will talk later on about the, the attempts to, to, to economically develop the Palestinian uh, minority, but discrimination in all aspects of life uh, still exists, uh, whether it is resources going to education, to health, and we had the COVID-19 in the last two years, the, the, the gaps and differences in the treatment of COVID-19 of this pandemic in Palestinian society and in the Jewish society, in the sense of the government effort put into it, uh, is not equal to say the least. So I described two different uh, 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 groups of people, collectives living in Israel. So for, for, for if you look at the average Palestinian person, the last May was a wave of resistance of this oppressed group of people, no? So some of the people who took to the streets had a clear elaborated agenda. Uh, others were driven by anger, uh, mainly because of the attack against Al-Aqsa Mosque and this uh, religious uh, feelings that, are, uh, uh, that were hurt or uh, people who felt anger about this. Many other people were motivated by the uh, uh, very beautiful example of resistance set by the Jerusalem uh, youngsters. So there was motivation because you see what is happening and you want to be part of it. Uh, and others just wanted to consume their anger, just to put it just straightforward. They suffer from the state and the, the state policies and the police uh, treatment, and they just wanted to go out and just really express uh, their anger. So it, it's not an organized campaign. There weren't any uh, political movements who were steering uh, the protests in the street, but it was a political uprising, definitely a political uprising. Uh, and in this sense, the tough hand of the police, of the authorities in dealing with this uh, uprising, it wasn't an attempt to restore uh, the public order. It was aimed to kill the, the new resistance uh, uh, sparks, yeah? to stop any kind of, of uh, moving up or moving to the next level of these individuals or groups who took to the streets that they, the, the, uh, 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 to organize in movements, to formulate their demands, to, to continue their struggle. So this is, uh, 
in short, why I think it was like, this is how I see it. It wasn't just a, a, an incident. It was a wave of resistance. And we talk more about it later. There are all the time we see this kind of waves uh, of resistance and then uh, oppressing this resistance and so on. Terrific. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much. So this wave of resistance, this mobilization, historic Palestinians out in the streets. And you've also set, set us up and talked about the police repression of it. And also we know that there were um, gangs of uh, Jewish extremists who attacked Palestinians in the streets. So there was, were specific places where violence broke out. And Orwa, that's what I want to ask you about you have looked systematically at where violence occurred and also where it didn't. So can you please tell us a little bit more about what you found out, what you've come to understand? Yeah, sure, Saran. First, uh, it's important to, to, to give a picture, a clear picture to, to the audience, uh, uh, what happened in May. Like, uh, I, I'm, besides uh, being uh, an expert in urban planning, I was also a victim uh, of these riots because of these uh, attacks because I live in downtown Haifa in the historical area of Haifa and uh, my house and my neighborhood was surrounded surrounded by uh, by hundreds of uh, fascists calling death to Arabs uh, breaking uh, windows with uh, throwing stones attacking Arabs in the streets Palestinians in the streets uh, looking for actually for uh, for victims to beat them up, so uh, it was really terrifying uh, days and horrifying days. And uh, I think like it it is really a shifting moment in our relations with the, uh, between the Palestinians and the Jewish majority and the state uh, in, in general. But uh, but as an expert, uh, this gave me it gave me also and. Um, the drive to look to look for uh, the the real uh, um, uh, um, reasons and uh, and the processes that happened. So, uh, if you if you can, uh, Kristen, share uh, and uh, and images that I uh, prepared uh, to illustrate for the audience what what I mean, because I I tried to find to look for the question why uh, where where the rights happened actually. And why these riots happened in a, a really cent like a certain places, not in all places. So if you can take a, a, like I, I draw a map actually, a, looking for a, what Rami said, the binational cities. So there are several. There are two kinds of bi binational cities, or or what we a, mistakenly say a mixed cities. So we have the historical cities that were like Haifa, Acre. Jaffa, Led, Ramli, that were occupied in 48 and destroyed. Some of them were destroyed totally, like Led and Ramli, and others were destroyed uh, for, for half of it, like uh, Haifa and Acre and, and uh, Jaffa. So after the destruction of these cities, the mixed cities, what we call the binational cities or the historical cities, I prefer this uh, term uh, more, um, Palestinians, uh, <laughs> Re rebuild their lives in, in them. Like, for example, in Haifa, 77,000 Palestinians were expelled during the Nakba in 48. There remained only 3,000. They were centered in, under a military rule for 10 years. A military rule means that if you want to get, get out from the neighborhood, you need a permit from the, from the ruler of the, of the area, from the military. And actually, these cities were developed throughout the decades to become uh, the most important cities for us as a, as a community. But in parallel, also the state built other cities that became mixed uh, through different processes, demographic processes and mobilization. Yeah, and, and, and actually we, we see that the riots happened not in all mixed cities, yeah? not in all binational cities. It only happened in historical cities. And this takes me to the, quest to the question, and why riots happened only in the historical cities? Why riots happened only in Haifa and Akka and Acre, in Jaffa and Led and Ramli? And, and it's important to see where it happened. 
Yeah, what, where, what is the location of the riots, of the clashes, of the lynching, of the attacks? And when I like went deep to the these locations, I found very interesting pictures, Ariane. Like I found that that inside the cities, I describe it as that there, there are different spaces inside the historical cities. So we have the historical space that is uh, is Palestinian, yeah, that where Palestinian community live uh, and and centered in in vast majority, and we have around it, surrounding it, hybrid spaces. The hybrid spaces are actually spaces where Arabs, Palestinians, and Jews live together, but without the superiority of the Jewish community of, and, the and without the inferiority of the Palestinians. And it's very interesting to see that how Palestinians also developed and, uh, and expanded throughout the city, actually. And, and these hybrid spaces could created new spaces in the city where Palestinians uh, uh, empowered their status in the city. And we have also the seemingly, I call it the seemingly neutral space, that it's the general space where, of, of course, it's controlled by uh, the majority of the Jewish uh, residents and where Palestinians, we, there are some Palestinians living there, but they are really a minority. And uh, of course, the, the public space and the atmosphere and the fabric, and it's an all new and all uh, it's not historic, of course, and it's all controlled by the Israeli and Jewish uh, discourse, of course. And what I found that the clashes and the attacks happened between the Palestinian historical space and the hybrid space. What I call, I called it like uh, on the seam of the wound, because the historical spaces in the, in the cities were, were, were actually destructed, yeah, were, were eliminated were uh, were uh, destroyed totally in 1948 and uh, and this is the historical wound of these cities this is the historical wound of, of our people and the community developed its new life after the nakba after 48 surrounding this wound and in order to uh, to to rebuild itself from this wound but this wound is always there and when we, when the hybrid space, when the new spaces of uh, mixing between Palestinian and Palestinian communities and uh, and Jewish communities uh, developed around the wound, yeah, there's a, a sort of a certain of a sort sort of a seam that was created of the wound, and the clashes happened there on the seam of the wound, and and you can see it in the map that I drew in. Uh, uh, where, where, where uh, in Haifa, for example, and also on the other slide, I found it also in Acre, in, in Jaffa, in Led. All the clashes happened on the edge of the Palestinian historical spaces that were destructed and destroyed in 1948. And it's really interesting, yes, I am to think about it. Like, why? Why, why it was happened uh, there? Why these clashes, why these attacks happened on, around, the, the historical spaces. And, and I think that the fascists want, want, wanted, and yeah, through, through their uh, attacks, they wanted to, 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 to draw and to illustrate the border lines of separation in the historical cities. And they wanted actually to unleash the seam of the wound yeah, by drawing these lines of separation. Because fa fascists, of course, they want separation. They don't want this hybrid space. They are, at the, they are against this hybrid spaces, yeah? where Palestinians are having a much more, uh, a, a, a bigger presence in the city yeah? and the larger uh, and the more stronger uh, status in the city. They want us to, to be in a ghetto, uh, surrounded by, uh, like separated from the city and, and, and ghettos. And, because of that, I think that the fascists attacked the Palestinian historical areas of these cities in order to create these lines of separation again. And I want and, and like um, that the most important thing that happened is not only in Jerusalem. Like there's another another incident that uh, um, also made the, like dry um, was a really big drive for all the, the attacks that was in Jaffa, where a Palestinian family 
living in a house controlled by the state. Um, we will talk about it later, how, how these houses became to be in, under the ownership of the state. But the state actually controlled uh, thousands of houses in Palestinian historical areas and where Palestinians live uh, under this, uh, this control. And the state is uh, systematically uh, selling out these houses to either to the private market or to settler groups that they come uh, to and with the clear declaration that they want to Judaize the Palestinian neighborhoods. And that what happened in Jaffa that the set, a settler group called the Garain Turani, it's uh, the, like the biblical uh, seeds or something like that, that wanted to, to, to buy the house with the Palestinian family and to expel the Palestinian family from it and in order to Judaize it. So, and this created the very big, uh, large demonstrations against these actions of the state and against the Judaization of settler groups in the Palestinian historical cities. So, in, in general, I will sum up that we, the, the wound of the historical cities where the Palestinian historical cities were destroyed in 1948, and we rebuilt our lives around it and became to be much more stronger uh, with our status and presence in the city, is threaten, threatening actually the fascist uh, uh, hegemony, yeah? where settler groups don't want it. So they try to attack us around the wound yeah? in order to keep us in the ghettos. And not only to keep us in the ghettos, also to Judaize, to try to Judaize systematically with the collaboration of the state by selling them our houses. Yeah? in order to, con to continue like, to, to pursue their project. So this is in general what happened, I think, in terms of spatial uh, processes that they gave the grounds to the political um, attacks against Palestinians. Orwa, thank you so much for that. And I, I, um, I want to summarize a bit to make sure that I, that I get it and also that our, that our listeners are getting it. And I, and I just want to start by saying that it is so powerful to have you, a, an, an expert in urban planning, on this program and in this conversation, because so often when we talk about Palestinians, we're talking about political processes or identity, but we don't have the expertise in land and planning processes in what the actual structures, the meeting place between the state and people's lives looks like in this deeply concrete way. What, what, are the, what happens with planning? What, where do people actually live? And um, what happens when, when people mix? How do they mix? Yeah, it's so very important, Sarah Ann, because like, as you said, like, when, when we talk about Palestinians uh, and uh, residents in Israel or in general, we talk about the, their political status, where mm -hmm. we are excluded totally from decision-making processes, where we don't have any control on our destiny you know, and our lives and our future. This is first. And second, we talk about the legal status, where we have laws that discriminate us uh, clearly with the uh, written and uh, uh, in, in the law where, uh, where we as Palestinians are discriminated and there are extra rights to the majority, to the Jewish majority. And there is the cultural status where, where our identity is, uh, is threatened and attacked. But I think that the spatial, what I call the spatial status, the, our status in the space, in the city, and in our daily, daily lives is also very important. And it's connected to, the, to these three realms of the political and the legal and the cultural. But the spatial gives us more uh, uh, strength also as Palestinian community where we control our lives in, in our daily practices. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so what you gave us specifically about the Nakba is that the historical cities have these wounds from the Nakbas, the, the, the areas in the historical cities where there was immense destruction and that those specific sites are where the violent, when you, when you did the analysis and did the mapping, that's where the clashes were held. That's where the fascists came back, these mobs of Jewish extremists um, who we now know were organizing on WhatsApp and Telegram and um, and also that the police were aware that they were organizing ahead of time. Um, police that... protected them, Sarah Ann. Like, uh, as a victim of these attacks, I saw the police um, protecting 
these attacks and, and they didn't they didn't arrest anyone from them yeah so the police it was a col with a collaboration with the police and it was a real clear message from the state that uh, you can't raise your head up and yeah, this is was really clear yeah. message Arwa, and and what happened with the israeli police it wasn't just them protecting this is this is uh, important to emphasize it wasn't just the israeli police protecting those uh, uh, jewish uh, rioters it was with the active help of israeli police we actually have live footage we have actual footage of israeli police with uh, uh, israeli rioters in lid attacking the mosque and the church we have uh, we have them on tape uh, 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 we, we see the Israeli police actually uh, uh, escorting uh, Israelis while the city is under curfew, meaning Palestinians are kept at home while the Israelis, uh, uh, Israeli rioters are allowed to uh, uh, roam free while being protected by the Israeli uh, police and attacking with the Israeli police Palestinian neighborhoods and Palestinian, and Palestinian homes. This happened in Jaffa as well, and it happened in several places in Haifa. Rami, I'm, I'm going to ask you about LID in, in one moment, um, and I just, I just want to say, Orwa, I'm so sorry that, that you experienced what you experienced, and Rami and Hana, I know that you also experienced things, and I'm very grateful that you shared what it was like for you, and, and um, that you shared the personal experience and brought that in, and, and gave the, the gift to our audience of hearing what it is to be surrounded and attacked by fascists, which is important for us to to, to see you and to hear you. And so I'm so sorry that that happened and I'm grateful that you shared it and that you're here also sharing your expertise. And, and Rami, now I wanna ask you actually to speak both as a, 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 a person and a participant and as, and as an expert um, on your hometown of Lid. The, um, the idea for this very conversation came from an interview that I saw you do on Israeli TV where you confronted the interviewer for inciting against Palestinian citizens um, very powerfully. And then later you wrote an article about that interview um, saying, now I'm quoting you, no story begins in the middle when you are not allowed to provide the broader context and tell the whole story, you know you have to fight even harder to get the word out. So get the word out here, tell us please, what are the historical, social, economic dynamics that explain what happened in Lid in May? What's happening in Lid overall, please? Sarah, and with your permission, I, I want to start by talking, saying a couple of things on Israeli media, if you don't mind. Great. Uh, how ironic that this uh, 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 anchor on Israeli TV, by the way, we counted the number of times he incited against Palestinian citizens of Israel during the live broadcast, during a three hour live broadcast. It was eight times. I called him, I called him on one. Uh, that I was able to hear because I was waiting outside and somebody sent me uh, a recording of him calling to change uh, uh, and to, gun, to reload the gun magazines and start basically shooting Palestinians on site. Uh, uh, so that's what I saw and I responded to that. But apparently he was doing that all along. And this wasn't just a unique case. This, happened, this was happening all over the place. Palestinians weren't allowed to present their case on, on, on national TV. This fueled more racism, more hatred, more tension, more riots, and the unrest grew bigger uh, and to, 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 level, to the level it was very hard to, to, to be contained. I mean, it wasn't, it was, by all means, it was, it was never contained until it uh, naturally died off. Uh, um, so, so, so yeah, the Israeli TV functioned very poorly. And how ironic that this anchor actually allowed me to take this interview, translate to English, and basically spread it all over all over the place. I mean, it, it got to you, and this is how you and I started uh, started talking on this and started talking about this event. Uh, it, 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 I made it to uh, uh, to Israel. I'm sorry, to American mainstream media with that interview because I wanted to expose mainstream Americans to what happens to what happened uh, it what happens to us uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel and how the Israeli mainstream is highly problematic. Now, while Orwa was talking, he mentioned the term Judaization. Uh, a couple of times. Uh, so in order to understand the current story of Lid, my hometown, we, I think we need to go back to that term and maybe uh, uh, break it down some more. So, so if you're an American, I guess the best way for, uh, for you to understand what Judaization really means is to imagine a town in, I don't know, in the American Deep South, let's say Alabama, uh, uh, with a majority of a black, uh, 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 with a majority of, of, of black people uh, uh, living in it. Now imagine local government decides 
that they don't want to see so many black people in this in this in this town and they need to have a white majority and they actively start allocating budgets and funds and actively work on bringing more white people to move into this town in order to have a white majority in that in in in, in that town now I know that the American mainstream would call this as a KKK policy. I lived in the States. I, was in, I lived in Massachusetts during uh, the George uh, Floyd uh, demonstrations. And I saw many, many, many white people. I think most of Massachusetts took to the street and, and supported uh, 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 the black community and demonstrated against the police brutality in the States. In Israel, this is mainstream. When you say Judaization, when you start a Judaization policy and you have a clear strategy on how to Judaize a binational city, this is not considered racist in Israel. This is considered mainstream because it serves the idea of the Zionist ideology, uh, which is to have a Jewish majority all over the land. So what happened in Lid? Uh, Lid was a city, uh, 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 it was a Palestinian city, like we talked before, before 1948. It was occupied. Uh, so for a population of around, I don't know, somewhere between 30 to 50,000 people that were uh, residing in Lid during the Nakba. By the way, some of them were refugees that fled the city, fled to the city from other places. Only between 500 to 1,000 Palestinians were allowed to stay. Uh, so the city was ethnically cleansed. Now, this wasn't the only time that the city uh, 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 bled. You know, the 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 wound uh, uh, was never was never healed. Like all was said in his and before that, so 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 the ongoing Nakba of the city uh, uh, continues to this very day. Uh, in the '90s, uh, the uh, the Garin Torani uh, group, which is a, a group of, uh, of 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 Israelis with a right wing religious nationalistic ideology, started moving into the into the city with a clear idea of Judaizing the space. Obviously, when we talk about a city with a with a, with a, with a Palestinian uh, uh, with a Palestinian uh, population, uh, and, and this, and, and we also have to remember that the uh, Jewish uh, people of of Lid. I'm not talking about the Green Tarani people. I'm talking about the actual, you know, residents from before uh, uh, um, are disenfranchised. And you know, if you look at the social economical social economical scale, they usually they're usually on the lower uh, uh, the lower part of it. Um, so. So we saw a lot of crime. I remember in the 90s growing up in Lid, uh, one Israeli police chief on, on, on national TV described Lid as the drug capital of the Middle East. Uh, the city was infested with crime, poverty, uh, mainly within the Palestinian community. So the, uh, the state's uh, uh, um, solution to that was to Judaize the space. And then they started moving into the city. Now, following the, uh, uh, in 2005, Ariel Sharon decided to evict the settlements in, in Gaza and move the Israeli settlers uh, someplace else. A lot of them moved into the city. So this was a major boost to the idea of Judaizing. They started building their own settlements. They started, they started settling in Palestinian neighborhoods. So if you go to, uh, 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 to, to some of the Palestinian neighborhoods or to neighborhoods with a majority, a clear majority of Palestinian people, and you would see Israeli flags on the windows, this means this is a settlement. Israelis started moving to these places in order to Judaize the space. So while this is happening, and while the city, supported by the state, is allocating funds to support these people, while the Palestinians in the city are getting deadly squat, and by the way, at the same time, also the Jewish residents of the city, the ones that don't belong to this a uh, 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 racist right-wing uh, uh, group are not getting the funds they're supposed to be getting. Uh, all this created a lot of tension between the two, between the two uh, uh, communities. Mind you, I come from a city where they demolish uh, Palestinian houses. They demolish between 10 to 15 Palestinian houses or buildings every year, annually. So you can, you, this, this, is, this, is, this is an insane number. It is not a very big place. Uh, it's a city of around 80,000 people around 30,000 of them are Palestinians. Uh, so imagine when, if you're a Palestinian in Lid, most of the people in Palestinian neighborhoods don't have even building permits to, to, to uh, they had to build the, house, the houses without building permits because um, oftentimes there are no infrastructure, approved infrastructure plans in their neighborhoods. And this allows the, the, the city uh, and the, you know, the establishment in general to use this as a political whip against you. So on top of all, on top of, all of that, bringing settlers to the city uh, 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 and having to see them 
getting you know any you know getting a lot of you know resources from uh, uh, from the state and from the establishment while you're getting nothing obviously created a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of tension uh, so when the demonstration started people took to the street and mind you when the this was a this is a very important thing to mention during the first two or three days of the demonstrations uh, most like most more than 90 percent of the demonstrations were peaceful Palestinians took to the streets, families, all people took to, elderly took to, the, took to the streets with Palestinian flags, chanted for Al-Aqsa, for Sheikh Jarrah, and for Gaza. This was met with, uh, uh, with police brutality. I remember how Israeli journalists on, on, on TV, the professional ones, the very few, called them, called them out, called the Israeli police for, for doing that, and they were silenced immediately, as if the Israeli police are never wrong, as if the Israeli establishment are never wrong. Uh, uh, so the violence uh, uh, um, promoted uh, uh, clashes between uh, between 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 Jews and Arabs. And but but in order to understand, like like you said, Saran, in order to understand what was happening in this very complex place during May, we need to go back uh, uh, all the way to 1948 to understand that the open wound of the Nakba was never healed because the Nakba was still ongoing. Just to give you a little tiny example, if I may. Uh, one last thing, Litz saw a massacre in 1948 in Dahmash Mosque. It saw a couple of massacres, but this well, I'm going to talk about this one. Um, so after the uh, people around somewhere between 250 to 300 Palestinians were massacred in one of the city mosques, uh, their bodies were carried outside to the square in front of the mosque uh, uh, to be burnt. Um, we call that square in front of the mosque, in Arabic, we call it the Wal Shuhada, Martyrs Square. Uh, this is the unofficial name of it. The Israeli establishment called it Palmach Square. Palmach was the name of the brigade that committed the massacre. So whenever I go by that square, and this is in the central bus station of Lid, right? So, you know, if you live in Lid, you go by there a lot. Uh, it always sticks like a sore thumb, you know, it's a big, it's a reminder of not only the bleeding history of the city, it, also, it is also a reminder of the ongoing Nakba of the place and how the Israeli establishment is not only not, not, not willing to recognize the Nakba, but it, it, it is kind of provoking us all along. Rami, thank you for all of that. And you brought up the American example, which I, in the American analogies, which I think is very helpful for people. And in, in the last piece about Martyrs Square and, and Palmach Square, I know that you were living in the United States when we had a lot of renaming happening with oh, more, yeah. monuments being oh, yeah. removed, buildings being renamed, oh, yeah. schools being renamed. Um, so thank you for, for explaining all of that to us. And, and Hana, I want to I wanna turn to you. Thank you for your patience and ask you, um, if you can talk to us more about the degree to which Palestinian citizens of Israel identify with Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, which is something that you've all, you've all talked about, but I want to ask you to go into it more deeply and also specifically talk to us about the, the primary, primary considerations and tensions, particularly with regard to questions of the integration of Palestinian citizens into Israeli society. And I know that you have very specific analysis about uh, the integration of Palestinian citizens into the Israeli economy and the importance of, of, that, of that piece of the picture. So please unpack for us. I think this uh, webinar comes in the perfect timing to speak about the uh, degree in which Palestinian citizens and they identify with Palestinians in the West Bank, if you consider the uh, last uh, week's uh, prison break of six Palestinian prisoners, prisoners from the Hagilboa prison, uh, I think if we analyze how the discourse in the Palestinian society inside Israel regarding this incident, I think it answers the questions or at least it provides uh, uh, hints to answer the questions. And to put it shortly, I think what it says is that 73 years of Israelizing, let's not say Judaizing now, let's say like the attempt to Israelize the Palestinians in Israel have failed. In, in which sense they have failed? In, in the sense that they, the, the six prisoners did not turn into terrorists in the eyes of 
Palestinians inside Israel. They remained uh, freedom fighters fighting for a justified cause. And I think if, uh, if I was the Israeli establishment, I would consider this as my greatest uh, uh, failure. Yeah, like all the, the, the construction of, of uh, uh, curriculum in the education system, all the uh, uh, attempts to minimize or to, to uh, put limits to the, to the spaces of what is legitimate politically and what is not, all these attempts by the establishment have failed to uh, um, change Palestinians in Israel into just being Arab Israelis. Deep down inside, they remained Palestinians. And we see this in many escalations of, of uh, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, that at the, the harsh points, if you go to the feeling level of people, of where their heart tends to, so Palestinians in Jaffa feel part of the Palestinian uh, uh, people in Gaza or in the West Bank. Uh, Palestinians in uh, in uh, uh, feel the same. Palestinians in uh, uh, Haifa or in uh, Ma'alia, it doesn't matter where you come, or in the Naqab, in Rahat. You, Palestinians inside Israel, everywhere in the times where the conflict escalates, they uh, uh, go back to their uh, national tendency. And this is uh, uh, something very uh, bothering and annoying uh, for the Israeli uh, establishment. Yeah? In the last 20 years, uh, the, the Israeli governments have put a, a great deal of investment into uh, uh, closing the gaps between Arabs and Jews. What gaps? The social and the economic gaps between uh, uh, Arab and Jews uh, inside Israel. Um, and this kind of contradicts to, to uh, what we've said before uh, about the oppression of the uprising. And the, I think this is a very important point to, to think about. And we are still in the process of thinking about it and analyzing it. But let's just, let's try to understand why is the Israeli government trying to integrate uh, uh, Palestinians into the economy? Um, so in, it doesn't come from uh, the logic of correcting the past uh, or acknowledging and correcting past wrongs. It comes from a very uh, uh, neoliberal logic of economy. If Israeli economy wants to continue growing at the rate that the, the, the uh, leaders, the Israeli leaders wish for, they need 20% of the population to contribute to this growth. It's very simple. It's very, uh, um, it fits very nicely into the, the uh, economic logic of, of uh, Israeli economy or of capitalist economy anywhere. And Israel was uh, accepted into the OECD as a member and the OECD has all these measures and these reports and uh, uh, um, the, these reports showed great gaps between the Arabs and the Jews. So in order to uh, uh, keep up with the requirements uh, of being one of the leading developed uh, economies in the world, Israel had to uh, uh, actively push forward uh, the Arab population to generate more income and to generate more uh, uh, products. Okay, but we don't forget that the last, I said in the last two decades, but the last two decades, we only had right-wing governments. In Arabic, we say, you know, like, I don't, one, one is worse than the other. There is no limit to how, how much uh, uh, all the superlatives you can uh, say about uh, uh, how, right, how much right-wing all these governments were. So, so, so how does this developing uh, uh, policy of Arabs fits into their agenda? And I think that the, the solution found by the, the Israeli uh, uh, leaders is that they talk about economic development that is very individualistic and not collective. They don't talk about developing the Arab economy in Israel. They talk about uh, uh, moving more members of the Arab society from one place to another, but they do not uh, 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 
talk about uh, the Arab, the Arabs as a collective, uh, and their their assumption is, and it's not an assumption that uh, uh, is not also elaborated. Uh, you can find evidence for this uh, assumptions in if you uh, read uh, policy papers. So the, the, the more educated and the more, let's say, um, integrated in the economy the Arabs are, the aspiration is that they become more individualistic, less uh, uh, caring of their uh, uh, national uh, identity or of their national uh, um, uh, feelings or tendencies, uh, and that they want to, to, to be more and more part of uh, uh, the state. And the other condition for this developing to, to, to happen is to harshly uh, oppress collective organizing, political collective organizing. This is the other side of it, yeah? So individual progress, go ahead, become doctors, become pharmacists, become scientists, become whatever you want, but don't do anything uh, uh, collectively as in uh, uh, organize and try to uh, uh, demand uh, collective rights. So we see more and more and more arrests of activists. Uh, in this last, in the, in the recent uh, uh, events, the police even named it. You know, they had an operation to arrest uh, 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 Palestinian activists with a branded uh, operation. Uh, we see in the recent years outlawing of movements, of political movements, like the Islamic uh, uh, movement, the northern side of it. We see now attempts to criminalize uh, um, Hanin Zoubi as a symbol of uh, 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 the, the uh, of ballad of a tajamma. Um, and I think what we are seeing as going along with this economic development is reinforcement of this division between good Arabs and bad Arabs. This is something that has went all along uh, uh, the history of Israel, uh, but the, the, the good and bad Arabs of today are not the same as good and bad Arabs in the 50s or in the 60s. We're not talking now only about collaboration uh, uh, as in snitching or, or uh, uh, providing information. We're talking good Arabs today are, are Arabs that economic development in the borders of the uh, uh, Israeli logic of economic development is good enough for them. These are the good Arabs of today. If you, and uh, uh, we have now a split in our parliamentary uh, uh, politics in the Palestinian society. We have a, a one a party that is says, this is good enough. This is what we can achieve. And we're going with it. Uh, uh, this is Mansour Abbas and the, the Islamic movement. This is a choice they made. They said, this is what we can, achieve in the Israeli parliament. And in order to do that, we can, we don't uh, lower our head too low because the, the, the new, the, today it's not, uh, the good Arabs of today are not going with their head too low, but also not too high. You know, I think this is for me, the metaphor uh, that uh, kind of sums it up. And, uh, uh, and the results of the election, uh, if you look at the Arab society, you can see a split. We kind of, there's still a majority uh, uh, leaning towards the, the uh, uh, not that, like, not to, to, the, to, the, to the parties that are, I, I'm trying to be sensitive in how I define it because I think we, we, we mistakenly uh, in our analysis, uh, uh, use two harsh words in order to, to, to describe this split. And it's not such a big split. It's not like the gap between the two uh, parties is not a, a huge gap, but I mean, the Arab society is split. Part of it says, yes, for integration, we can't change the national uh, big issues. Let's focus on our individual uh, progress. Maybe that would help us as a collective later on. And you have the others who still say, 
we can't we don't need to choose between our national tendencies and our civil uh, uh, engagement or our civil rights we want we want both we want to take we take our citizenship uh, seriously but we also don't want to give up our uh, national tendency and i i don't know uh, smarter people than me are trying to analyze where would society go to in the future and i think uh, nobody still like nobody has the answer yet great Anna, thank you that was so um, helpful and clarifying and and um, and important for us to hear and and I I wonder and this is this is a question for for all three of you given given everything that you have described and the circumstances that Hana just explained to us um, where is the mobilization now where are things we we've been talking about what happened in May this historical mobilization Rama you said it sort of naturally fizzled out. Um, Hana, you've, you, Hanan just explained to us all of these other factors and um, and tensions and split among splits among Palestinian citizens of Israel. So, what's happening now? Are things is, is there still mobilization? Has it continued in in some ways but not in others? Hana, can you tell us briefly because yeah. we have we have more questions to ask and we're starting to, yeah. to run out of time. No, my, my answer is very short. I go back to the metaphor of waves. We had a nice wave of uprising and resistance, and uh, now we don't. We're not on the verge of another wave, at least from what I see. Uh, and I think uh, where things would go to is relies on the question whether we uh, manage to politicize this uh, uh, popular protests or these uh, uh, people who took to the streets. If they, if it remains only as a, a, a wave of just expressing anger, I think we'll just stay in the same place where we are. But if political movements here can manage to kind of bring people together to, in order to to formulate, to think of a, a, of themselves as as a as a political group that aspires to. For, to, to, to also formulate what is the change, the profound change that they want to see. And then we will start seeing some movements in the political uh, scene, both parliamentary and outside the parliament. And I think, uh, um, but I have to say that I am like, I'm not too optimistic, but I'm also not pessimistic. I think we are uh, uh, at times that uh, um, great forces, greater forces than us, uh, uh, steer where things are going and uh, I think we just have to be ready when there's another wave to try to uh, uh, build on it. No, This is I think what uh, activists and political uh, movements should be doing right now. Great, thank you. Rami, what do you want to add? I, I really like Hannah's uh, wave uh, wave metaphor. Uh, um, uh, um, I don't think the wave is quite over yet. Uh, I want to go back to the lid example. What happened in lid after May um, can send can can actually we can we can I think we can we can we can deduce from what happened after May in lid uh, as to what is planned for the future. And during May, a lot of settlers from the West Bank, from places like Yitzhar, Nokdim, and Hebron, uh, who are very violent settlers with 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 you know with with firearms, moved into the city. Uh, in order to quote unquote protect her, but we we saw them attacking Palestinians. That's what they did with the help, with like we said before, with the active help of, help of Israeli police. Now, what is planned for lead? These are the same people who are Judaizing the West Bank. These are the settlers that are moving into Palestinian land, uh, 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 dispossessing uh, 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 Palestinians, and and basically taking over. This is what they're planning and doing in lead. If you Border Patrol, Israeli Border Patrol have stayed in the city long after the events of May have, you know, kind of fizzled out, like you said. Uh, almost throughout all the summer, you could see any time in Lid, you could see uh, Border Patrol police cars patrolling the city. Uh, um, so it's, it's not, a, it's not a, what's happening in Lid, what will happen in Lid in the next few months, I, we believe uh, that it will, it will escalate again, at least in Lid, and uh, uh, judging from what happened before, just a couple of months ago, 
uh, I think the tiniest match uh, has a potential of, of, of lighting everything up again. Um, um, Judaization is here to stay. Settlers are actively working hard in lead and they saw the amount of resistance that we, they, they will be facing if they, do, if they try to do that again. One more important thing that happened in, this in the last wave is the uh, uh, mobilization of Palestinian youth and teenagers. And I believe TikTok had a very uh, uh, major uh, role in this. Um, I mean, I'm not on TikTok. Um, are any of you guys on TikTok? I have no freaking idea what's happening there. Uh, but apparently uh, uh, teenagers do. And they saw what was happening in Al-Aqsa. They saw what was happening in Damascus Gate. They saw what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah, in Gaza. They took to the street and demonstrated. And by national cities, places like Lid and Haifa, there are oftentimes uh, what we call uh, collaborators from the West Bank, people who actively collaborated and colluded with the Israeli occupation and were then uh, uh, brought from the West Bank and they were put in these binational cities uh, in order to, I don't know, protect them or something <laughs> because, uh, as a, or as a reward or something. So anyway, uh, the um, children of these, of these uh, uh, collaborators all of a sudden took to the street with the Palestinian flag and chanted for Gaza and for Sheikh Jarrah as if to wash themselves from the crimes of their you know, elders, of their, of, their, of their parents and grandparents. Uh, this was truly unprecedented. These people are now, these people now fully consider themselves to be Palestinians. They do, have no identity crisis. So whatever will happen in Lid again or any other place in Palestine, but especially in binational cities, has a potential of lighting up the situation again. Thank you, Rami. Um, I want to move us into our last, we have just a few minutes left and I have a, a question left for each of you. Um, and Orwa, we haven't heard from you in a little while. I want to turn to you, please. So with your expertise in urban planning um, and the relationship between ethnic minorities and, and their rights in, in planning processes, can you talk to us about what needs to be done in terms of the relationship between planning and, and the historical wounds that you have spoken of? Yeah, of course. So like... Um... To continue what Rami said, that uh, I think the most important outcome of the recent uh, or the current uh, uh, uprising, demonstrations, and clashes is the, um, to take out the planning practices from behind the scenes, to take it out, and to put it again on the stage in the front. Because always planning practices and, uh, and the issues of how the space, how the Palestinian space is being changed. Uh, throughout the years and through deep processes of new liberal processes of the market of planning policies of maps of uh, different uh, practices that the state does to take it out from behind the scenes and to uncover it yeah, again uh, and to put it on the stage in front on the line on the front of the discourse and i think this is this is one of the most important outcomes of the recent uh, uprising. Like, uh, it's important, Sarayan, to understand that wh when we talk about planning, I think planning is a constitutional political concept because it's a, it's a rights concept or a rights-based concept. Because like, if we, if we take that linkage between laws, written laws, and what happens in action, uh, in other words, planning, so we can see that there's a, a shift going on since 48 to today uh, towards the Palestinian uh, presence or spaces. So at first, after the, after the Nakba, after 48, there were two laws uh, mainly approved and they shaped our reality, our lives. That is one law is called the absentee law that considered the Palestinians absence uh, and, and it enabled the state to control uh, uh, over 1,500,000 acres of our lands and the houses and the historical areas of the cities. And, and the other law was, is called the land acquisition law that enabled to, the state to use these lands, these assets, our, our houses, our lands, our cities, in order to promote three main aims, uh, settlement, security, and what they call development. And of course, it's development only for Jews. 
And these two laws actually uh, shape the reality of our lives, of our spaces, of our, our home, actually. And it enabled the state to control 93% of historical Palestine and all historical areas in the cities. But these laws were shifted, actually, during the, the recent uh, decade uh, with the new law called the privatization of state uh, property. And, and through this privatization process, over 60,000 houses in Haifa, Jaffa, and Acre were sold out to the private Israeli market. Like the first two laws enabled the state to control 60,000 buildings in our historical cities. Now we have only 4,000, Sarian, in Haifa, in Acre, in Jaffa, in Led. It's a catastrophe. Like we are, we are talking about selling out our homeland to the Israeli private market and to settler groups uh, like in Jaffa and Acre and Led, yeah, that actually they uh, exclude us from our homeland, from our historical uh, spaces. So this is uh, the legal realm. And, and by the way, there's a law, uh, another law that, that the audience needs to know it, it's the, uh, the acceptance committee's law. And like you hear this number, Sarian, 948 towns in our homeland, me and, and Hana and Rami can't by law, we, are, uh, 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 we, are, we can't live there by law because this law, the, the acceptance committee law, Get enabled five, 942 towns and villages, Jewish villages, Jewish towns, to build a committee, a committee, an acceptance committee law that refuses anyone who doesn't fit the village culturally. So of course, Palestinians doesn't fit the Jewish uh, majority uh, culturally. And this is what we're talking about. We are talking about discrimination by law. Like imagine 942 towns in my homeland, I can't live there. Yeah, and, and add to that, that our historical Palestinian cities are being privatized and sell, uh, sold out to the set, to settler groups and to private companies. So this is first a process, a parallel process where planning actually moved uh, like uh, driven by the state, like what Rami said about lead, the state gave a free land to settler groups for free, yeah, to build their settlement. In, in the middle of Led, between uh, around the historical city of, of, the, of, of Led. So the state by action, by planning processes is promoting actually the, the exclusion of Palestinians from our homeland. So this is, uh, this is the scene that what, what's happening. What, what needs to do, what should be done, I think, it's not an uh, it's not an uh, deliberative or allocative justice. We need a restor restorative justice. Like we don't we don't want a share of the cake, but we want a compensation for the hunger actually that we suffered since the establishment of this state. Like uh, so, it's not a matter of a share of the cake. It's not a matter of allocation of resources. It's a ma it's a matter of correction of historical wrong that is continuing to today. Orwa, thank you. Thank you for your, your clarity and your, elo your eloquence and for explaining all of that to us. Thank you so much. And Hana, my, my last question for you is, a, is, a, is something of a similar question. Um, as an activist, most recently against, uh, for the struggle against crimes and weapons in Palestinian society, I want to ask you, what is right now most urgent for you? What's at the top of your agenda? I think uh, the topic that Arwa was talking about, the issue of planning, housing, and lands, I think this remains the main uh, issue for us as Palestinians in Israel. And it connects to what I talked about in the Israeli attempt to develop the economy of Palestinians. It left land resources outside the picture of, of uh, uh, we don't see uh, uh, in, the, in the development uh, plans enough allocation of public land and so on. And I think this is a key in our relationship uh, uh, with the state and on it, it will also kind of yeah, uh, uh, say where we are going from now. The issue of uh, uh, crime and weapons, 
I think it's just the shadow of this issue. It just puts everything else in danger. I think any other social uh, uh, struggle is shadowed by uh, uh, organized crime groups that are giving the, the, the freedom to operate uh, within our uh, neighborhoods and cities and villages. And as uh, civilians who are not organized and not uh, uh, armed, we don't have a way to fight organized crimes unless we force the Israeli government to do its responsibility uh, and uh, uh, limit the presence of weapons, whether it's legal or illegal weapons. I think for us, as uh, we are a feminist group of, of uh, women trying to lead this uh, struggle, and we see a, a, a straight line and relation between legal weapons and illegal weapons, because legal weapons uh, or organized crime are using uh, uh, legal entities such as, for example, um, uh, guarding uh, companies in order to, to collect protection money and their weapons are registered and licensed, but they are used for criminal activity, which is uh, 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 laundered uh, as a uh, legal uh, business activity. So I think we are dealing with uh, uh, something that is um, we, we can't do anything in our society, not in education, not in uh, progressing women's rights, not in urban planning. And that, there is no uh, a topic or aspect or field that we can do any change in if we are uh, threatened by these economic uh, uh, entities that are organized crimes with weapons and arms that uh, uh, we, we are defenseless uh, in front of. So this is, I think, my um, the where I th where I think our priorities should be. Thank you, thank you so much. And our last question, and I'm so grateful to all of you for this conversation we've had, and I have many more questions for each of you. But alas, our time is coming to an end. And so, Rami, the question I have for you is also in many ways a question um, about the the seeds of future conversations. You work in narratives. You are a writer, a reporter, you are directing a film that is going to be released in a few months, Lid in Exile. So what are the stories that you think are most urgent to tell? Rama, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, well, I believe in cultural activism and I believe in uh, finding new and creative ways to, to tell the story. The story of the Palestinian people is not a new story. It's a story that we told many, many times in the past. Oftentimes it has fallen on deaf ears. I mean, it, I mean when, when people uh, act as if they're deaf and they don't hear uh, 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 our plight, uh, what's happening to us, uh, you need to rethink your strategy and you need to rethink how you tell that story. So that's why I believe in cultural activism and using art as a form of storytelling. Uh, uh, and yeah, also in a political context, as all art is about, you know, uh, uh, help people, you know, raise the right questions instead of answering them. Um, so that's why I decided to, uh, start, a, to, to, to start this project of, of, of making a sci-fi documentary uh, on lid, we, we're not just making a straightforward documentary on the city and the history of the city, but it's a sci-fi documentary. I don't want to talk about my film too much because we have to end. Uh, um, maybe we'll do that some other opportunity. And um, I mean, I, I also believe in using other art forms. I mean, we started the Palestine Music Expo, which is a music event that connects Palestinian musicians with people from the worldwide music industry. The former chief editor of Billboard magazine once told me, Palestinian artists have a very, they have, they have, as opposed to other artists in other places, uh, there's something that makes them unique. Uh, they tell a unique story no other artist on earth can tell. And, and, and that's why we need to celebrate them. That's why we need to celebrate our cultural activism and find new ways of, 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 of tackling the, the Israeli narrative. Uh, and I believe that Recently, the, it, 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 it is working. And the best example for that is what's happening in the States. I, I mean, to answer your question, I'm going to keep putting my focus uh, on, on American media and American mainstream. The fact that the New York Times 
uh, 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 is starting to publish stories about us, about dead Palestinians in Gaza. But not only that, two days before they uh, 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 um, put the, 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 the photos and names of dead children in Gaza on the front page, they actually put uh, uh, four pictures of live Palestinian people with the headline, life under occupation, the front page of the New York Times. This is unprecedented. The fact I was approached by so many mainstream American outlets uh, and all of them were asking us to tell our story unfiltered, uncensored, this is unprecedented. We need to capitalize on that. We need to keep doing that. We need to ride that momentum. But in order for us to do that, we don't just you know, tell our story. We need to think of creative ways of telling our stories and reaching out to more people and widening the circle of people who are willing to hear about Palestine and about the injustices that we go through. Wonderful. So thank you all uh, on, on that line of sharing your stories and sharing your expertise and your vision uh, and your passions. Thank you, Hana, Orwa, Rami, for talking to us today. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us for this event, who is listening to this event. We are so glad to be able to share this conversation with you. Check back to our website, www.fmep.org for a list of all of the resources we have relating to the conversation, including the photos that Orwa put together, put together and, and spoke about. Um, check back on our website for announcements of upcoming events, webinars, and podcasts. Subscribe to our podcast. It's called Occupied Thoughts. Thank you all so much for being here. See you next time. <laughs>